Thanks so much, Joyce. Um, I think we should give a hand actually to Joyce and Sylvie for all the efforts they have in kind of like putting all this together. Um, it's so inspiring to see, you know, people in Singapore being able to come together and, and just really um, support one another and, and have this um, environment to, to really talk about and be geeks. I think um, we all are geeks here probably, that's why we're here, and um, we're proud of it, and I, I just really love that about, about what you guys have done. So thank you for having me. So I thought I would give just a quick overview, because um, I look Asian, but people, every time they see me and I open my mouth, they're like, in Singapore, they're like, what? Um, so I'm actually Canadian, um, and I've spent a number of years in New York, um, and now I'm in Singapore. Uh, so I say I'm a temporary New Yorker and, and Singaporean. Um, I'm an industrial engineer, as, as Joyce mentioned, um, by trade. And I think, I'm just curious, is, are there, who out here are also engineers? <laughs> Okay. Okay. <laughs> Com sci, like computer, obviously, everybody. Yes, yes, okay. Um, great. So for me, I mean, the comm size always made fun of the industrial engineers because we were like the ones who were optimizing business. Like, really? Uh, <laughs> so we were on the low rung of engineering. But um, so I actually ended up, I did engineering for, for three years and then I, I actually moved and fell into marketing and I'll tell you guys a little bit more about what happened. And I think, you know, for today, I don't think I'm any wiser than anybody else here. Um, I'm just happy to be here to, to share my story a little bit and, and talk about, I think when I came out of university, I really didn't know what I was supposed to do. And even now I'm 34 and I don't know necessarily what I'm supposed to do or what I'm going to do next, but I know what I'm doing now. And so um, what I stand for, I think, um, is this quote, I think, is, is a beautiful quote. Um, I'm just going to read it out. I began to realize how important it was to be an enthusiast in life. If you're interested in something, no matter what it is, go at it full speed. Embrace it with both arms. Hug it. Love it. And above all, become passionate about it. Um, and and at, at the end, what uh, Roald Dahl says is, lukewarm is no good. And I think if anyone knows me, um, they, they know that I never pursue anything kind of halfway. Um, and, and I think that's just the way that I, I've always been. And, and I think engineering and technology has given me this great foundation to just, no matter where I am in my career, I'm always leveraging the, thing, the skills that I've learned to think a little differently. And I think all the engineers out here, which and all the secret engineers, I think you guys all have probably thought, um, you know, you can apply it to your jobs too. And that for me is, is very inspiring. And, and I love going into a room where we're doing a creative brainstorm and I can actually um, offer some insight based on the, my, my um, background. Not necessarily, you know, something that's directly related to code, but, um, but definitely the skills you learn. So this was my first job. Um, for this was for this is just an old screen cap I found, but um, you probably look it's it's really hideous. I'm, I think this is actually a current um, iteration of the of the application too. So um, what happened is I, I came out of engineering and um, out of industrial engineering, and I didn't really know what I I wanted to do. I didn't have great grades either, but. Um, I was probably one of the one engine, like some of that one engineer that kind of had a bit of EQ, so they were like, "Oh, okay, we can drop her in consulting." Um, so, so this was a tra um, a transit software company where they think of them as Microsoft Office, but instead of um, offering office suite products, they offer transportation um, products for optimization, whether it's optimizing your drivers or optimizing the bus routes. Um, optimizing bus routes was incredibly complex and I was walking into these rooms and, and these um, planners, these transit planners, literally were organizing schedules by pieces of paper, like strips of paper upon paper and they were all kind of like aging through the process and we're like, okay, there has to be a better way to do this. There has to be an optimization algorithm that we can code to, um, to help make this easier. And then you layer on the people portion of this, which is what I focused on. It's like, okay, now you've got the optimized routes. How do you optimize the number of drivers you need um, it just got really complex. So um, on top 
of that, um, in the U.S., everyone is unionized. So it was like, oh, if I work on a holiday um, and it happens to be also on a Saturday, I get like double time and a half. But if I work the Monday, it becomes like triple time and a half and something really crazy. So we had to try and find a way to kind of optimize all of this so we weren't paying people like triple, quadruple the rates. So that's basically what I did, and I did it for San, um, San Francisco Transit. Um, so it was like from the cable cars to the to the buses to the subways. Um, but then I also did it I did this for um, places like Nashville and Cincinnati. So it, I was very lucky in, in my first in the start of my career to be able to really travel as a Canadian to all these um, places in the U.S. to um, just really be able to work. And it was crazy. They let me into their server rooms, and they're like, "Okay, go forth and put whatever you want to put in." I'm like, "I can take." this whole thing down you know so um, and I wouldn't say I was a strong coder by any means so um, so I always rely I had to rely a lot on my on my actually comp sci uh, friends so um, so you must wonder you know going from from transit software how did I make the leap to like the next step so stupidly I think this is this is one of those things where I learned in life was like okay when an opportunity presents itself and it's a interesting opportunity there's um, why not just try and pursue it and see what happens so um, Someone came to me and said, hey, Anthea, you know, um, there's this company called Critical Mass. Um, actually, they're here in Singapore, too, um, but they're a Canadian company, and they offer business solutions for clients. I'm like, oh, business consulting, cool, I can do that. Um, so what I found out was it was a marketing agency that did um, banners. So circa um, 2007, I think, um, we only had four sizes of banners. I think nowadays there's like hundreds of sizes because you have all your mobile devices. But I literally was able to dig up um, last night some of the old banners we did for the Inspiron. Dell was relevant at that time. They're not a relevant brand now, I would say, but um, they, were, they were relevant. And I still remember walking into that room as an engineer and being like, okay, we're going to kind of brainstorm about the Inspiron and how we're going to bring it to market. And I remember sitting there and it was my very first brainstorm. It was my first time realizing as a developer or as an um, industrial engineer that there's other people in the world that are smart that um, aren't just, you know, physics majors or, like, you know, people who, who specialize in science. There's so much more. There's so much more to creativity and beyond book smarts. And I think that was a turning point for me that I was like, yeah, I want to stay here forever now and, and just and learn how to better communicate and solve business problems, but using our, our, our engineering mind while being able to apply creativity. Um, what a brilliant idea. I was so excited, and they always, you know, thought of me as the geek. Um, in the room, but I didn't mind. I didn't mind being there just to just to learn and absorb everything um, um, from them. So from there, um, I realized what I missed was we were doing great banner work, and we were doing a little bit of work for City City Bank and. But um, when it came to implementation, we were working with all these kind of like uh, technology partners. So half the time, you would create these really great ideas, and it would get watered down and watered down and watered down because the software or the back end company would be like, "Oh, we can't do this. Okay, but we'll do this." And then we'll they butcher all of my work, and I was uh, my team's work, and I was so upset about it. Um, so what I realized is that I needed to marry back the world of technology back into my life a little bit more. So this is when I went to um, another agency called uh, Sapient. I don't know if anyone's heard of it. They're pretty big here. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so Sapient is a company that actually does, um, they, they started as a technology company. And at the time when I entered, they were just trying to kind of go into the marketing space. So they were always very technology driven in their solutions. Um, so when I went in, uh, we happened to be pitching for Harley Davidson globally. And I happened to, you know, stumble upon, hey, who wants to help on this really awful pitch? You know, it was like pages and pages upon pages of, of detailed information that we needed to kind of put together for them. And I was like, okay, I'll do it. And we won. Uh, with, and we, and four years later, I think um, we built, we actually went in and replatformed their entire um, site for them globally, which is like 34 languages um, in, in some, oh, 34 countries in 15 languages, which is, which is is kind of crazy, including Arabic, so right to left, left to right. Um, I think what I learned here was, in my journey, was just that you don't always, it's, it, 
you never know. I, I don't think that I was like very, I, I knew I wanted to get back more into technology, but I didn't really know how. And this was just the perfect fit was being able to kind of marry my, all the skills I now had kind of sort of acquired from marketing, but not really. Um, I still feel like I'm learning that every day since I don't, I've never taken a marketing course in my life. Um, and then going into, going into a brand like Harley Davidson. So that's so epic in the US, but like in Asia is a totally different market. So I remember still talking to my team in Singapore and they kept complaining to me and they said, you know, um, this work is not gonna work for our region. And I was like, why? Just listen to me. I'm in, you know, I'm, I know, I'm in Chicago. I'm in your headquarters, I know. And I think that's the thing that, um, that I realized too is very humbling is like, is, is the fact that um, <laughs> I don't know everything, but I also don't, you don't know all the nuances of all the different markets. And it was, it was actually a very interesting um, learning experience for me. Um, so, so we actually ended up doing customized work, customized content for the different markets because obviously um, how you kind of portray the brand in the Middle East or Asia does matter. <laughs> um, so yeah, that was, that was technology. Um, any questions around, around what I did? There, no? Cool, okay. Um, so current state, where am I now? I think um, I spent a number of years at, at Sapient. And then um, I remember talking to Joyce and, and saying to her, you know, what I realized though, after doing tons of, tons of then hardcore technology work, because it was like one third creative, and then it would take two thirds of the time to implement anything, um, even though we could definitely implement it. And we had like a team, massive teams to, to implement major technology um, replatforms, um, was wanting to go back to the creativity side and really being able to solve business problems for multiple kind of clients. So, um, so where I am today is I'm now at Rokin, um, and I've been at Rokin for the last few years, and um, I, I got interested in them. Actually, they came to me, and um, I, I was interested in them because they really took a digital-first approach to marketing. So I know uh, many agencies, especially in Asia today, they tend to do a lot of marketing that's like, okay, what's the big idea? And then um, we'll just kind of apply it to, to, to digital. But what we realize is that digital, is innate, like everybody here has a, has a phone, everyone's probably holding some sort of technology here. Um, and we have to think about things digital first, but how can you communicate with people effectively through digital? Um, so let me give you a little background on Rokin. Rokin is a 15, 15 year old company. Um, we started in New York, and at that time it was like, okay, how do we put websites on the web? Because we had to, um, because people were saying, oh, okay, I'm, I'm, I don't have a presence online, so can you just build me a website? Um, but where we've come to today is, like I said, it's about how you actually um, interact, and, we, and I think that's where it's interesting for us with a technology background. Many of us here. It's how do we actually interact with all these people that are all digitally innate, have many things happening at the same time. How do we stand out above the crowd? So it's, it's interesting because it becomes not just about, um, it, it's not technology first, nor is it the creative first. It's like this perfect perfect marriage um, and there's never I can't tell you like there's like a methodology to this um, <laughs> there isn't it's always a bit messy and it's always a bit different but that's okay it's it's that's how we get to the solution um, so Rokin is actually an, a company owned by Publicis Group um, we got bought about three years ago so we're part of the big mammoth um, agency world however we do run autonomously so we've been kind of it's been good because we've been able to kind of come in as this kind of um, smaller agency of only 150 people globally to um, to come and, and look at how we can solve different business problems and that for me was was really interesting being able to have a lot of different clients not just one mammoth Harley Davidson um, but being able to kind of dig my heels into different types of problems um, on a day-to-day -day basis. So I thought I would show you guys a little bit of work. I'm not trying to market Roken here, but um, it's just the only way I can kind of explain the, the type of stuff that's got me excited now um, with my technology background. So airlines. Um, does anyone work in the airline industry here? No? Okay. It's incredibly complex, like incredibly, incredibly complex. Um, and they have a million systems and they store all their data in all these different places. And you know, like, I don't know if you guys know about GDSs. And, and so basically, um, when you go on Google Flights and you try and find like a flight, um, there's uh, airlines 
can put their flights onto those inventories, they can choose not to, they can select what they put in there. Then there's like these other um, platforms called like Sabre and other platforms where you can then choose to um, put certain types of flights. So that it, it becomes like a four layer process before it actually gets to your actual site. So. Um, we actually started as a business working for Virgin America. They came to us and asked us, oh, hey, we need to launch our planes on the ground. We don't even have planes right now. What do we do? Um, I, we don't have planes on the ground in America. How do we launch our brand? How do we create a loyalty program? How do we create a site? So we did all of that for them. It was great. JetBlue loved it. And then JetBlue told us, hey, can you fire Virgin so you can work with us? Because they're a direct competitor. We're like, OK. So. <laughs> so JetBlue, um, they are, I don't know if anyone's heard of them um, outside of, okay. They, um, they're, I would say they are a budget airline, um, but they aren't the stereotypical budget airline that you see here in Asia, like a Tiger Air or a Scoot, where it's all very price driven. Um, for them, it's more, um, they wanted to kind of create this experience, though they were budget, it was about building, human, like, um, building experiences wherever they are and being able to kind of take a sense of humanity into flying. So we touch every aspect of their business and this is what excites me is that just because I have a technology background and yes, I need to do all of this, I also get to do really great marketing work. Um, I think being able to have a technology background and being able to kind of apply your thinking into um, all the different channels like I mentioned before, how complex it is. This is not a brand that you can be like, don't worry about it, we're gonna do like a responsive site and you'll be fine, right? It's, it's not like that at all. In fact, it was so archaic, we had to do like platform, we had to do channel by channel, we had to do this, the main site, then we had to do the mobile and iPad, we like did all the designs three years ago, they launched last year. So, you know, it's, it's a very slow process and how do you keep thinking for the brand what the next thing is? Right? How do you stay? And, and that is a technology problem, right? It's not just a business problem. It's okay, yes, how do you stand out as a brand? But also what we have to work closely with their technology partners to understand what we can do next. So right now we're talking to them a lot around personalization, which I know is kind of a very common thing now. Um, and even though people don't all execute it very well, um, but for them, it's a really big challenge if you think about personalization. It's all, it's all to the point of like, okay, if I see that you're traveling from New York to Chicago every single week, I know I can, how do I identify you and know that, oh, hey, you're a business traveler. From there, how do I encourage you to maybe take a side trip on, you know, on your flight home to go to, I don't know, San Francisco, right? Like this kind of complexity is not something that's just um, something that can be solved from, from a business mindset. And I think that's what's unique about this job that I love is that, um, is that I can come in and say, oh, okay, well, from a technology standpoint, this is, these are the type of challenges they may run into, the way that their data is set up or how they, um, I may not know how, they, I don't know the details of how to code, but I know how they've coded some of their um, systems. So we can, I can help them without being a technologist myself day to day. Um, Apple Watch was just really cool because when they launched, they invited us to go work on, because um, they obviously when they launched the watch, they needed to have some applications in there. So they invited JetBlue in to create one of the first airline apps for the Apple Watch so that when you got the watch, it already had that. Um, so they actually took our phones. They um, they locked us in a room and we literally were like, hey, we need this feature. And then they would go run to the engineers. The engineers would code it and we would add the feature. But even then we were brainstorming on the spot of what people would want for the Apple Watch because we didn't know. That was our first, like when we got there was the first time they told us, this is the Apple Watch. We had no idea what really it was supposed to do. So I think um, this is all, sorry, this is all the Roken stuff I have to show, but um, just to, to share a little bit more about me, I think at the end of the day, it's um, what I've realized is that it's not just, it's your, you can see in all of these case studies that I was able to apply what I learned in, in, in school and kind of that foundational kind of thinking and apply it in however I was contributing on each of these kind of projects. And I think, you know, there's no definite path for any of us in terms of, I think I was very lost coming out of school of what I was supposed to do. And I sure as hell did not ever think I was going to end up in marketing of all things. But um, I think our, our skill set is very unique. Our way of thinking is very unique. And we need to, we do need to embrace that. And I think um, all I can say is the world needs what, what you, every one of you have got. Um, and, you know, I don't think I took the most regular path of what you would think a, a, an, an engineer would do, but um, it doesn't, I think the world is your oyster and, you know, go for it. So, yeah.
Q&A. Yeah, <laughs> quickly, yeah. Okay. So I actually have a few things to give out. I just want to see if anyone had questions. I'm not bribing you with a question, but yeah. <laughs> A GM, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, you know, it's. I was joking around about how um, how I had like a relatively okay EQ, so that's why they took me in initially. But yes, absolutely, I think that was that was um, something that it was funny because I thought, you know, my dad was just being hit, like an Asian dad, and he said to me, I said, Dad, I'm going to take either business school or I'm going to go into engineering. And he's like, Anthea, you're going to end, end up in a business no matter what you study. You're going to somehow work in business. So why don't you focus on the actual skills and getting the, the, the technology skills, and then you'll be able to learn the business skills. So I don't, you're right, I don't have a management background. And that was just, for me, it was about just learning from all of those people around me. And when I don't know something, I, I was very open to kind of just being hungry and, and learning and just and so that was stuff that I just kind of learned along the way um, I, I'm still learning I think um, how do I start a business in Singapore <laughs> you know it's it's very it's very different market than than the US right so um, I'm and how do you even manage a team here is very different um, the the way that I run the business here is that I need to hire local talent. Um, I don't believe that I can pretend I understand the culture, but I still, rem I, f I definitely failed. I went into um, a couple pitches when I first started here with just my team in the U.S. and the people that were sitting across from me were all local um, customers, and they're like, "What are you doing? Like, why are you talking like you know me?" <laughs> right? Like, I, I don't, you know. So I think these are the things like I, I've fallen um, and, and you just kind of keep learning from it. But I haven't, yeah, no, I haven't actually taken a course. So, yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Who do I turn to? That's a... Yeah, that's actually a great question. I'm so happy that RuPaul's um, teachers are here tonight. I think... Um, for me, it's, it's, yeah. <laughs> I think they should be, you know, they, I sometimes, I always joke with my friends that are teachers, I'm like, you should be the highest paid, you know, people, um, because you fundamentally really, yeah, <laughs> you fundamentally really shape every single person that you see. I think, you know, I'm sure you guys are like, oh, wow, the, you know, like, it, it's very, you'll think back to all the students that, that you've shaped, and, and I think, definitely from the teachers from my family from but more during my career it was um, I think my biggest uh, jump was actually a sapient um, when people when management just believed it believed in me and I was also very willing to kind of do whatever I, I know this is this is um, you don't always want to say yes because then you'll be overloaded but I often did say yes to anything and everything even things that I didn't I wasn't sure if it was going to go anywhere such as the Harley Davidson um, account and when I got when I did that it gave me the opportunity to do things I was really uncomfortable with I, I remember one of the um, CTOs at the time actually said to me he was like so Anthea Target's coming in on private jet um, they're opening in Canada they don't really know what to do so I'd like you to talk about the globally distributed model you have for Harley Davidson and I remember sweating through my shirt and being like, okay, okay, I'm gonna present. And these guys are all sitting there from their private, like just got off their private jet. And you know, very, very uncomfortable. But I think it's when you get into that kind of zone of being, a l being uncomfortable, um, it helps you grow immensely every time. And I remember, you know, first pitches where I was practicing and practicing in the bathroom and people, you know, like just so nervous. And, um, but you do have to kind of latch on and, and I'm so grateful. I think I just wrote um, to my LinkedIn um, ben, uh, person who hired me for trapeze, my first job. I, I just messaged her the other day and I was like, you know, thank you for giving me a chance. I didn't have, you know, great marks. I didn't have what you would say is great on paper, but you took a chance on me. So thank you. And she said to me, Anthea, I challenge you to take a chance on others. So I, I think that's, that's great advice. Yeah. Yes. 
and yes. Um, I, I think actually engineering probably helped me a lot for that because I think a lot of you guys know uh, for engineering or comp sci or whatever you do in university, it often you're, you're like thrown way too much work and too many things that you're trying to balance at the same time and I remember and I think that actually created a good foundation for me to be able to multitask faster than maybe some other people in in my career um, so yes absolutely have to multitask but I always you know you always have to prioritize for me it's always okay which client has I know this sounds very mechanical and I'm just gonna say it but it's always who has the big, like the largest amount of revenue and then from there, it's like, okay, but like, but my focus is will change, right? So for here, for example, in the Singapore market, it's a lot of new business. So how do I focus my time on new business, but also then, and then also still, how do I build a team to help me really ensure that the clients I do have are being serviced um, well? So it, it's kind of like, it's, it's a jigsaw puzzle every single time. And then on top of that, you know, your personal life, right? Work should not be everything. I think everyone encouraged you to kind of, I, I think actually Singaporeans are quite good at it. I call you, I call my colleagues all unicorns um, because they always have like three jobs. I'm like, how? How do you do that? I don't understand. Like, I mean, Joyce has her day job, but she also like runs this. So I'm like, I don't really get it. I don't know how you do it, but you know, I, it's definitely important to to have that balance. And, and so, yeah, there's no science to it. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Hi. What would be one thing that you would do differently if you would restart your career? Wow. <laughs> oh. Hmm. You know, I know. I don't know. I don't know. You know, one of the things I did learn is that you can't win at everything. So you do have to kind of put your focus on certain things at certain times in your life. And so I don't think I would have changed anything. I, I did. I'm very humbled and, and honored to be, you know, doing what I'm doing. And, and um, I don't, but there was no clear path to get there, right? It was, you can see it's like a bit of like everything. And so you just never know what's going to take, what, what opportunities will take you where and just being able to kind of own them and embrace them. Like I said in my first quote, just embrace them and, and give it all you've got. Right. So, and I think the thing that I always keep in mind is always, always, you know, there's like this marketing lingo called a the ABCs, always be closing. It's like this really aged, it's like from the 70s, it's from a movie. Um, but for me, it's always be learning. So I know when a time is to go is when I'm not learning anymore from where I am. So that's just something that I've lived by. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. open more offices in Asia. <laughs> um, no, I think, you know, finding, right now is finding good partnerships with, with the right type of um, uh, clients here, and then, you know, then we want to expand further into, into Asia. So I think that's a very big challenge for myself in understand for me it's it's understanding the market is a is a big challenge for me so um, we're learning and I'm, I have a team and we're we're working through each of the, working through that yeah thank you I think that was the last question oh but there's one more okay one more last last question. <laughs> Well, this is probably this is like getting. Uh, it's actually outside of this this industry and outside of this talk, and it kind of speaks to the idea of being more balanced. I think um, Singaporeans also, I notice, are very good at um, the the yoga practice here is very strong, and it's very hot here, so I don't like to do anything outside. So I've actually been taking um, a yoga teacher's training course, and I think um, it's it's just interesting way to kind of take myself out of out of my day to day job um, and think about and focus on other things. And I think I think that tells you a little bit like you know you don't always have to be learning within your industry. Although I think my colleagues have said to me, Anthony, I'm worried that you might quit this industry altogether and become a yoga teacher. No, I won't. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, so yeah, just learning different things, not just, you know, the one thing that you're doing, not just taking more and more and more and more marketing courses, but learning things outside too. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much.
talk to you after. Okay. <laughs> yeah. No, no, I'm joking. Go for it. Yeah, it, it's, it's definitely in its elementary stages um, here in this market, but I'm very um, respectful. You have to be respectful of where the market is at. And so typically how I'm working with clients right now is kind of um, easing them in. So yes, they may be starting with like, okay, what media plan are we doing for next year? And, it's, and you're like, okay, well, maybe you could better spend your dollars um, on maybe revamping your e-commerce site or something like that. So, but you can't just do it walking in and pretending like I, I don't want to walk in and say, hey, I know everything. I come from the States. I know it's, I can't work that way. So I'm very respectful and, and I try to kind of work within their boundaries and then slowly push them. Um, so I've been, so with the relationships we have here now, um, we're slowly pushing them towards 2017 and kind of thinking, hey, maybe you do digital first. Um, maybe you don't spend all your media dollars on TV. Um, because that's that's usually the bulk of the cost. Um, if anyone's not in marketing, but yeah, so I don't, does that help? It's it's a slow process. It's it's not like overnight. Yeah, I know it's frustrating. <laughs> thank you. Okay. I'll pass you your notebook later. <laughs> so um, thank you so much, Anthea. Big more big round of applause for her again. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much.